committee. So thank you for joining today. Um, we had a little snafu with our website that um, had the link incorrect from the December to the uh, March meeting. So I'm going to give a few minutes for people to get connected. So please bear with us as we um, give them a few minutes to get connected so we, before we start our formal meeting. So thank you for holding. Good morning. I see we have a few more people join us today. Thank you for coming in. Unfortunately, we had a little uh, mishap with our uh, meeting uh, link on the website. So uh, thank you for joining. I'm going to give the um, give folks just a couple minutes to make sure they have the correct link to join. This is the uh, meeting for the South Dakota State Technical Committee for March 28th, 2024. So please hang on and we'll get the meeting started directly. Thank you. But this is Pete Bauman. Can you hear me? I was curious if my, my audio. Yeah. OK, thanks. Good morning. Yes, we can. OK, we've got a few more people that have joined our meeting today. It is uh, March 28th and the South Dakota State Technical Committee meeting. Um, we had a little mix up on the link for on our website. It has the December and not the March meeting. So we're working to get that corrected so people can join the meeting properly. Uh, we were going to give uh, just a couple minutes, uh, uh, two or three more minutes for people to get connected. So please stand by and thank you for the presenters for holding.
Okay, good morning. Uh, today is March 28th. It is the South Dakota State Technical Committee meeting being held virtually here for South Dakota. And I appreciate you taking your time to uh, join us today. Um, we did have a little mix up on our website for the December versus March meeting. So the link uh, was incorrect. So uh, hopefully we're getting people on the correct meeting and thank you very much for joining us today. So I'm Colette Kessler. I'm the Assistant State Conservationist for Partnerships here in South Dakota. And um, right away, I have a couple of housekeeping things before I turn it over to uh, the State Conservationist. So um, well, with the virtual um, meeting, in, you know, in the past, uh, our Secretary Kathy Irving had sent out a, a mailing, a hard copy mailing. We can still do a mailing, a, no a meeting notification to people if by U.S. mail, that's what they would prefer. If so, they need to please notify us that they would prefer um, something sent by U.S. mail. So the method that we're going about now, where we have this virtual option for meeting notification, is um, through a shared mailbox. And that shared mailbox starts with an SM for, sh for a shared mailbox, dot FPAC, which stands for Food Production, Agriculture, and Conservation than NRCS SD partnerships. So if you see an email come in with that app, with that name on it, that's that's from us about the state tech meeting. So um, we're, we're handling notifications through there. The other way that is actually better is through the farmers.gov website. So when you go to farmers.gov and then you go in the upper right corner, there's a place called subscribe. And in that subscribe, um, uh, menu, you can enter your email address, and then you'll go to a whole bunch of options for topics from NRCS, and, and it's actually connected nationwide, which is really, really cool. So in that list, there'll be an option for South Dakota State Technical Committee. So get your email in there, choose South Dakota State Technical Committee, and then when we publish anything related to the committee, it'll go out to the subscribers of that list. Um, so that, that's a, another guaranteed way to get in. The other really cool thing about the farmers.gov uh, subscription list is that it allows you to go down to the county level for, uh, for notifications. So let's say you're a landowner and you have land in multiple counties. You, subs you could subscribe to those individual counties for any updates for opportunities within those counties. So it's really cool. So, okay, just a couple of housekeeping things here before we get started, and now I'm going to pass it to our state conservationist, Tony Sanceri. Thank you, Colette. Uh, welcome, everybody, to our uh, our first state tech meeting of the year. I really appreciate that everybody's taking an opportunity to come and participate in this, this meeting. Uh, I know the, the weather's been a little crazy over these last couple of weeks. I was driving back from Sioux Falls, and I was driving back in 77-degree weather, then it drops down to four, and they have a blizzard. It's just it's it's been a very interesting year to start off. And I know right now with the weather looking as good as it is, I mean, we have a lot of folks that are looking to try to get back out in the fields. I've, I've already seen that across some of the state. The people are already in the fields, they're already planting in some situations. So I know it's a busy time of year. The state technical committee in general serves as in a, a advisory capacity to NRCS and to me. The idea behind this committee is to bring ideas, technology, and issues to the Natural Resources Conservation Service to see if there's opportunities that, from a state level, we can try to put resources in place to try to address issues and topics of concern across the state. And this is why this meeting is important. This is why I value every single one of you being here to, to let us know what your thoughts are, and if you have ideas, or if you have um, technology that you'd like to share with us. Even in our Code of Federal Regulations, it talks about the State Technical Advisory Committee. And it, and it says the purpose of this committee is to build criteria to be used in prioritizing program applications, to help set state-specific application criteria, prioritize natural resource concerns for the state, to talk about emerging natural resource concerns and program needs, and to help advise and build conservation practices and practice standards for how NRCS operates in the state. This is what this committee has the ability to discuss and um, build. 
And so while we have a lot of items on the agenda that we're going to be talking about today, there's always room that if there's ideas that are coming from our partners, from our producers, uh, on how NRCS can serve South Dakota better. This is this is a venue to talk about that. And I and I encourage you, even if it's not something that's on the agenda, when we have an opportunity for questions or comments, raise your hand and, and ask. Let's bring it up. We might not make a decision today on it, but this is an opportunity for it to be raised. We have we have our technical experts in the in the room right now that are all listening and wanting to hear from all of you. So if you have comments, this is the venue to, to bring them up. So before we move further down the agenda, I just I want to make sure I'm acknowledging if we have anybody else on the call, any any members from our uh, congressional delegation or any other federal agencies, I'd like to take a moment to address this this committee. So I don't know, Randy, do you see anybody else on the call there? I'm not seeing anybody on the call at this particular time, but if anybody does jump on, we'll let. Okay, perfect. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and move right into more of my update regarding more just South Dakota. So we have had some tremendous success in South Dakota, even over just the last few months. Um, one of the big items is, is staffing. Uh, South Dakota is sitting better right now than we have for a very long time. We have close to 300 staff on board across the state and we're still growing. And what this is doing, this is allowing us to serve our producers across the state even better. Uh, we've, we've made some significant changes uh, in the state, even within the last couple of months. One is I, I need to take an opportunity to thank Jess Mahalski for her uh, in serving as our assistant state conservationist for programs. Uh, she took over that role when uh, Jeff Vanderbilt uh, was promoted into a different position. So thank you very much, Jess, for your hard work in that position. Really do appreciate that. Uh, Jess is now moving back into her role as the state uh, resource conservationist, and we have selected Val Dupres as our new uh, assistant state conservationist for program. So she started officially on Monday. Very, very excited to have her uh, on the leadership team. We've also made a couple of other selections across the state, again, filling some of these vacancies that we've had. Uh, we have selected uh, Paul Drayton is now our resource unit conservationist for our Three Rivers resource unit. And uh, Eric Rasmussen is our uh, resource unit conservationist now for the Central Plains. So we have uh, promoted some folks into more of these senior le uh, leadership positions across the state. Uh, Moving in, moving folks into some of these positions do occasionally uh, create vacancies across the state. So we have a couple DC vacancies, but even at this time, we have close to 65 offices across the state. So 65 district conservationists. And even with so many offices, we're only sitting right now with three or four actual vacancies across the state for district conservationists. So this is better than we've been sitting for a very long time. And again, this is all to be able to provide service to our producers across the state. So how is our how's our budget looking right now? There's been a big topic over the last couple of months regarding where are we sitting with our, um, our allocation. There's been talk about government shutdown over the last few few weeks and months. And I'm very happy to say that NRCS has a full year budget. We have a budget that will last us through the end of the year. There were a couple a couple cuts that were made that will be impacting us somewhat. Uh, there was across the agency about a $10 million cut to our conservation technical assistance funding. That's the funding that's uh, in providing technical assistance. So that's gonna be staffing dollars, that's gonna be agreement dollars, but $10 million spread across the agency doesn't impact us at, at an overwhelming level. So we'll be able to take that in stride and continue moving forward providing services and still looking at some agreements this year. I wanted to give just a, a very basic overview of how IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act, has impacted South Dakota over these last couple of years. So just talking about some of our main programs, uh, EQIP. EQIP grew from 2022 from 17, $17 million to 2023, 19, almost $20 million, and now in 24, $36 million. So you can see that that has grown significantly over the last couple of years with the introduction of the, uh, the Inflation Reduction Act. 
CSP, CSP grew in 2022 from 15 million to 26 million in 23 to 41 million in 2024. So we are gaining ground on how much uh, funding has been invested into the agency just over these last couple of years. And it's expected to grow even more as we enter into 2025. We have a lot of work and we have a lot of opportunities in front of us. And again, this is why this group is so important is this group can help set priorities for where is this funding going to be looking or where, where do we need to be looking at putting this funding as we move into the next couple of years. We have resources, we have the ability to impact South Dakota and we already are impacting South Dakota. Another item I wanted to touch on is strategic plan. I, I first want to come out and say thank you to all the partners that took time to participate in our, our efforts of putting together our strategic plan. We have the framework put together. We have the comments from our listening sessions, and we have a basic plan. Uh, we are still working on trying to get this, this formatted in a way that I can get it out to all of you so you have an idea of what we're going to be working on. But I did want to touch on some of the main topics that came from that meeting. The, the main buckets that we were looking at are going to be workload, improving our tools and resources, better communication, building partnerships, and then working on recruitment and retention. Those are our main buckets that we're that we're looking at. We've already started working in some of these categories and trying to find improvements. Um, as an example, we're already looking at in, in increasing the number of archaeologists we have on staff to make sure that we're we're not creating any unnecessary bottlenecks as we increase our program workload across the state. Uh, internally, in working on tools, uh, we're trying to centralize where our information is held and trying to, to create more intuitive ways of accessing our information internally, which is, has been an issue. Uh, we're looking at, at tr trying to build more of a, an outreach material library so that our partners will be able to access our materials and get access to our, our outreach material easier. Uh, we're also focusing, uh, making a significant focus on training and onboarding because of how many new staff we have. We already are making a lot of progress and making changes that are going to be beneficial to to our employees of South Dakota NRCS, but that in turn will make it better for all of our partners and our producers across the state. So again, I just thank you for taking your time to be a part of this. Thank you for all your efforts in, in assisting us to help our producers across the state make sure that our, our resources are being used in a, in a wise manner and that we're going to be able to, to keep South Dakota in agriculture for the next 100 plus years. So thank you for all your efforts. So I'm going to go ahead and turn this back. And we'll continue moving down the agenda. So I'll, I'll hand this back to you, Glenn. Great, thank you. All right, so um, with our agenda, um, and please know that uh, Randy had gone ahead and emailed that out to everyone, and, and hopefully the website will get updated, but you know what? Email works too, so um, so that would be there for your reference with the handouts. Um, so uh, with our agency, we've got our, our conservation uh, technical practices, we have our programs, and then and we have partners. So um, the formal part of our agenda, uh, we'll work through that, but What's fun for us, me, is to include updates from our partners. So I have two guest speakers today, and um, we're going to move forward with their presentations uh, right away here. And our first guest speaker will speak around um, uh, the grasslands. And um, the first one will be Pete Bauman, who is with the SDSU Extension Range, uh, and he's out of Watertown, South Dakota. So Pete, I'll turn it to you, and then after you, we'll we'll um, we'll go to Riley Cameron with their project. All right, thank you, Colette. Um, I'm going to share my screen here, and hopefully, I'll need some feedback from all of you. Whether it's I've got the right, got a few different monitors here, so um, I want to make sure I get the right screen shared. Um, can you tell me what you're seeing right now? We see um, you, Pete. You still saw that's that's unfortunate. Uh, <laughs> let me see here. Um, I need to move. Let me just see if I can move the presentation to. Okay, you're still just seeing me, not the yeah. screen. Oh, darn it. OK, how about now? Same? Same. Boy, you unlucky, unlucky group of people. 
Um, maybe somebody can code. I'm not all that familiar with Teams. I use I use Zoom more. So can anybody can anybody give me some input on why my so I hit screen share. Did you did you have to do anything on your end, Colette? Um, no, um, up, on, up on the upper right, it has that share button. And from there, you can pick the screen to be shared. Now, it, OK, it's finally it finally gave me the drop down. OK, now this should work. I'm hoping. There. Got yes. it. All right. All right. Well, thank we, you, Colette and um, Tony and all. Um, some of you um, have seen this. I, I got to tell you that when I do, when I've got this on, I can't, I can no longer see you. So if there is uh, any questions right now, I can't see the, the gallery at all. So Colette, I'd ask you to kind of monitor um, chat or other questions or if anyone's raising their hands. And then after I get through it, um, I will. I will address any of those questions, I guess. Um, if there's a pressing question during the presentation, that's totally fine too. Just interrupt me. Um, yeah. What I'm going to be talking to you about today is a back is the is the kind of the wrap up of a long term uh, present our uh, long term study that we've done uh, with uh, many of the partners that are on the room or uh, on the call here today. Um, oh, there I do have you guys in view. OK, so status of native rangelands in Virgin okay. Sod in South Dakota 2013. I'm going to put the caveat on there right away so that all of what I'm going to present to you is circa 2012 2013. Uh, it's a large data set. It's been a long haul processing data. You'll see why. So what I'm giving you today is what we looked like 10 years ago. So with that caveat, just just know or just understand that God's not making Virgin Prairie anymore. So all of what I show you today um, just have that little caveat that we're 10 years post already. So we've seen additional changes to the landscape since. OK, um, I want to acknowledge our funding sources. Uh, it's about a nearly 100 or about a one million dollar project. But if you can see um, the contrib contributions by partners has been significant and substantial. Um, and it's it's really been an incredible level of support. I want to call out specifically since we're on the state tech meeting is uh, South Dakota NRCS with making available the LIDAR data. I can't even put a number on that. Millions of dollars worth of, of actual uh, public dollars spent made readily available to SDSU for this. And I've got several people to thank, but uh, uh, Vanderwilt in particular, Nathan Jones and his entire team. And then also um, through South Dakota Farm Service Agency and the partnerships that are represented on this uh, committee uh, allowed us to acquire the what this is the non-public um, common land unit data, which is a whole nother story. It's a difficult data set to access if you're not um, basically a, a government entity or an affiliate such as PF. But anyway, um, excellent support all around. So uh, we've been losing grasslands over time um, and I'm, I'm, I'm abbreviating this presentation to a lot of you are aware of it. So basically there's two big questions. How much do we have left and how fast are we losing uh, our native sod? And I'm going to put the caveat on this is what is native? That's, that's even a, a debate. Um, it's not really a debate. It's a misunderstanding, but a lot of people think that native means CRP, right? Uh, and what we're talking about here is actually virgin sod that's uh, never had iron in the ground as best as we can tell. So we're talking post colonization. Um, post um, homestead actual iron in the ground. OK, so there's a lot of data I can draw on, but I'm just going to use kind of some some high level stuff. Basically, there's there's tons of research and and data that's come out since about 2007 on conversion of the Northern Great Plains. It's captured pretty well since about 2017 in the um, World Wildlife Fund's plow print. So I'm going to call out just their subset of this that's got the intact grasslands remaining. And if you follow the yellow aerial, you, you'll see that over the last uh, from 2016 to 2021, so about a five year period, we went from about 132 million to 129 million acres of intact grasslands. Um, this report still doesn't necessarily call out exactly what the content or makeup of those grasslands are, but in the northern plains, 
it's a mix of loss of uh, perennial covers, uh, planted covers, and of course, native rangeland. Um, the reason that it's very hard to tease out using high level data is that satellite imagery mixes up green things. Um, satellite imagery at the level that we can harvest it for the NAS data. Some most of you are familiar with that term, the National Ag Statistics Service. I've got just a subset of, of, of cover types here that get pretty mixed up by a satellite. And so we can get big picture idea of what's going on in the landscape, but we really can't tell you from satellite imagery whether it's native, alfalfa, a green cover crop, et cetera. So we had to come up with a different methodology. Uh, so this was developed by this methodology I'm going to show you has kind of been developed over time. SDSU, Pheasants Forever, Nature Conservancy were big players in figuring this out. Um, but what we've done is in the process of determining what a native rangeland or native grassland is, um, you can't look at any one thing and say that it def definitively is, but you can look at a whole lot of data to help you decide what is not native rangeland. So what I'm what I'm showing you is this deductive process that we've developed, and uh, um, what that means is if you walk through our process starting in the upper left hand corner, I don't know if you can see my cursor. But we take the landscape at a one mile square level and we use all of the resources available, starting with the with the FSA data, that cropland data that gets thrown out. Water over 40 acres gets thrown out and then we look at what's called NAEP imagery, National Aeronautical Imagery Program, I think it stands for. And we look for additional breakages on the landscape and then we look for all other things big you know, farmsteads, gravel pits, golf courses, et cetera, et cetera. And what it does is it gets us to the end of the line of the boxes that are shown in red is what do, what do we deduce as likely native rangeland? So it's not a quality assessment. So it could be pristine native prairie as shown in the left-hand box, or maybe um, I'll just use the word overgraze just for simplicity. Um, rangeland, you know, not well cared for as shown on the right. But in all things that never had iron in the ground and it's important to realize this because even that picture on the right uh, with the cattle in it is re it's, to some degree we're we're saying that that is recoverable or at least we should we should we should um treat it as such you know the third thing though that came up in this analysis is the impact of what we call go back acres and if you're not familiar with that term it's land that had been farmed in the past that had gone back or reverted back to a perennial cover. Oftentimes that was done by landowners realizing that the land was uh, unsuitable for farming, maybe low class, you know, four or five, six class, class soils. Or um, so it was either actively replanted or passively nature kind of just took took over. Um, and those that's primarily we think about that in Western South Dakota. That could be like your alfalfa uh, crested wheat kind of um, typical go back what we might think but there's also a lot of go back that is you know if you don't know the history it's almost hard to define um, a lot of those properties were were maybe tilled back in the day um, dust bowl era or in the 50s and 60s and have reverted back to some perennial cover there's also a little bit of a of a history of um, hard pan uh, tillage and especially in Western South Dakota, trying to make those lands more productive. Um, that's had a bigger impact than I think anybody's really realized. And that sometimes was a very aggressive um, approach to management. It truly looked like plowed up fields. The idea was that it was going to stimulate uh, things like Western wheatgrass, uh, grama grasses, etc. And actually the data shows that it did. But, you know, if you look at the results, I'm not sure that we would advocate for such land management today. However, those are important grasslands in South Dakota. And so we wanted to retain, we were not throwing those out as saying they don't matter for our grassland cover. So we're, we just have, have um, categorized those go back acres in a different way and, and retain them in the database. Okay. So then the next big thing that we stumbled upon, and had I known this 20, 10 years ago, our data, this wouldn't have been a 10-year project, was the LIDAR analysis. And if you're not familiar with LIDAR, in simple terms, it just shoots a bunch of lasers at the ground out of an airplane, and it allows you to see the 
ground uh, the topography through the vegetation, and it's a pretty cool, pretty cool system. So this is a, a picture of a go back field in western South Dakota. You can easily see with the naked eye there um, when you're standing on the ground that uh, that pattern of historic farming. You can't see that from the air. You cannot see that from aerial imagery. So this is where LIDAR really comes in handy. And I'll show you what it really looks like in our analysis. So this is a uh, typical uh, pasture area. Uh, Eastern South Dakota. I'm not exactly. I don't remember exactly where this is at, but this is if we if we take the lidar and we enhance this picture, you can start to see striations and patterns. Um, even if you look at the stock dam in the middle, it becomes much more evident and clear with the shadowing effect. So it really helps us look deep into the land. Um, I want to point something out. Can I get a nod or a, a thumbs up from someone if you can see my cursor? Okay. I see Riley's nodding. Uh, Riley, I'll, I'll, I'll look to you then. See this striations along the side of this hill? That would typically not be visible um, in any other way other than with LIDAR enhancement. That's probably cat stepping from grazing, uh, you know, heavy grazing pressure. But it does indicate that there's a, a pattern to the landscape that we wouldn't be able to see otherwise. Here's another great example of a pasture um where we've we were able to identify if you look at the patterns from what i've got labeled as unbroken sod you can see there's very much a uh, a random land pattern and then you get into this chunk of the pasture that's go back sod and look at the striations from previous breakage um so that's this this lidar tool has been a a, a tremendous game changer in this analysis so what does it mean on the land well if you take just an example of like say this is fault county um, we, through our analysis, indi we, we, we dropped points on about 7,000 acres, 6,600 or whatever, um, that we kind of suspected might be go back land just in one county. The LIDAR analysis then verified that we were about 88% of what we thought was probably previous broken was, but here's the thing. This is where it really, it really kicks in. 31,000 acres that we didn't even see um, that LIDAR indicated in the county um, as previously broken land. So it's really, in, really made this analysis much more accurate. Across the entirety of Eastern South Dakota, this is, this is pretty amazing. So we had dropped points on about 213,000 acres that we thought was probably had some go back history. LIDAR verified about 153,000 of that actually did have a breakage history, so about 70% of, of what we identified actually was. But here again, over over 400,000 additional acres that we couldn't even tell with the naked eye from, uh, you know, across all of eastern South Dakota. So pretty significant. Um, all right, at the end of the day, what does it mean for uh, the the picture of native land remaining in eastern South Dakota, about 4.8 million or only about 21% of eastern South Dakota is actually remaining native grassland and woodland to, in total. Or another way to put it, one out of every five acres remains as native in eastern South Dakota. Um, that doesn't mean that every one of those native that does not mean that every one of those historically tilled acres is black dirt right now. A lot of it's under CRP. A lot of it might have been returned to alfalfa or other perennial crops, grasslands. But so here, so don't get too shocked by this picture, but this is what we call the negative. This is the picture of the reverse of what I just showed you. This is all land in eastern South Dakota that has some sort of tillage history that we've proven. Pretty amazing um, impact that we've been able to have on a landscape. Sad thing is we're doing a whole lot better than a lot of other states on that regard. So 20% is quite high compared to Minnesota, Iowa, et cetera. Western South Dakota, we're doing a lot better, um, but we have to be very, very careful that we, we know our history and we know our story or we're gonna be destined to repeat it. So Western South Dakota, we've got roughly uh, 18 million acres of unbroken grassland remaining, about 73% or so. We anticipate that that's going to drop, or so that's about three out of every four acres is still native uh, rangeland. 
We anticipate though that that's going to drop to about by about another 10% or so once we're able to actually analyze the LIDAR data. That's the only thing we haven't got done yet on this project is actual Western South Dakota LIDAR. We've got all the data or almost all of it from NRCS, but we just ran out of money to actually process it. And the reason that I'm pretty confident in telling you that you already saw the story from Eastern South Dakota. This picture is all of the points that we've at, that we've identified in Western South Dakota that need a hard look with LIDAR. About 30,000 additional fields scattered across Western South Dakota. So we're going to see we're going to see those numbers of natives drop native rangeland drop. Um, and this is interesting. This is what we've identified as all of the historic homesteads that no longer exist in Western South Dakota via aerial imagery. Um, and that's that even that's probably a much very much underrepresented of what that actually looked like from homesteading and sod sod houses. But this is what we could actually see from the air um, just remaining. So and remember everywhere one of those dots is folks had to prove up land. So you got to assume that there's a, a garden patch or a 40 or an 80 that got broke just to be able to claim, make the homestead claim, right? So quite a history there. We all are very aware of what the tillage practices have been in the past and the advancement in technologies. We've got a game changer on the landscape now though over the last 15 years, which is simply using all of these great no-till tools that we have you know and i'll just be honest for grassland uh conversion so now it's basically sprayed out plant it in the first year you can grow a crop um no more breakage just just uh chemical chemical breakage is what we call it it turns the landscape so fast you don't even really realize it's happening so that's happening um eastern south dakota just to we did a we were able to fund a graduate student to just kind of do a sub project just to kind of try to figure out well what have we lost in the last 10 years i'm presenting data that's 10 years old what kind of change have we had over time we're still losing ground we're still you know if you can if you know your counties you can see brown mcpherson edmonds hyde hand and crazily enough minnehaha um heart of sioux falls still losing some grasslands so about 140,000 acres or so over the last 10 years. It's not a tremendous amount, um, and a lot of it is due to expansion of fields in the areas that previously didn't. So like at this, where my cursor is, 10 years ago, this red would have been all native. Well, you can see that they pushed that field out a little bit where they had an opportunity. So it's a lot of just small field expansion. Um, sometimes it's more, uh, obvious this is Hyde County uh, native pasture now it looks like this um, and in fact it's gone through uh, in the last 20 years uh, conversion and then salinity issues to the point where they don't even grow a crop out here anymore I go by this every time I go to my grassland coalition meetings and it's pretty much dead soil but it's got you know almost two dozen grain bins um, so that's just change in the landscape uh, a lot of recreational tillage still exists. Um, he's trying to scalp in a crop here or there. This is this is by Bitter Lake. Sometimes it completely fails. This is uh, Grant County. Um, I'm sorry if these pictures are just a bit fuzzy. Um, but what does it mean? Uh, over the last 10 years, about a we can account for about a 3% loss of native rangeland in eastern South Dakota, more or less. Doesn't sound like a lot. But over to the next, but if you expand that out to 3% um, over a nine year period, in the next 90 years, we would lose another 30%. This is where our kids and grandkids start to get affected. And that is equivalent to all of the remaining, currently all the remaining uh, native rangeland on, on the Prairie Coteau, for example. So that loss is still pretty significant. Um, I'm gonna quit there. This data will be completely publicly available on all to all, not just uh, not just agencies, but private landowners as well. Um, it's going to be posted on our Open Prairie site. I just got finished yesterday meeting with my techs. And we got everything ready to go. So within a few weeks, I think we're going to be able to have this up and available for all of our partners to be to be used. Um, I'm going to end there.
And I just want to put a plug in for the Grassland Coalition and the New South Dakota Grassland Initiative. Um, it's going to be over through these two platforms primarily. I think that we're going to be able to have this conversation at, in a real and meaningful way going forward into policy, especially for things like the State Tech Committee. So with that, I am going to quit. Colette, I'll uh, shut down my mic. And I guess I don't know if you want to take questions or how you want to do that. That's good. Well, we're doing OK. Um, we do have the next present presentation ready, but if there's somebody who has a question, you can either uh, raise your hand or uh, put it in the chat and we can come back to it later as, as well, too. So. Um, anything at this very moment? OK, then we'll move forward with um, with our next presentation and this. This project has been really cool. It's a result of a conservation and innovation grant, and the Elk Creek Conservation District has worked with uh, Riley Cameron, and it's just been a, a really cool project. So I'm going to let uh, Riley tell his story, and uh, when you're done, Riley, you can just turn it back to me. Thank you. Sounds great. Thanks, Colette. Hi, Tony. Hi, everybody. Thanks for having me on. Uh, this is my wife, Jimmy, if you don't know her, and uh, let me get my screen on here. Um, we're going to talk about the this is the year, the third year of our conservation innovation grant that we were awarded and and this that we're kind of finalizing this up and wrapping it up and uh, excited to tell you guys kind of some of the results that, that we had. So hang on just a second. Can you see the screen share? Yes, we see your PowerPoint. OK. Let me see if I, whoops. There we go. So uh, yeah, this is where we're at. We're just north of Rapid City. Um, and here's my my crew of girls, the best help in the world. Uh, pretty proud of them. So this, this conservation innovation grant came about that, you know, we realized that these old hay fields that we'd been taken from for generations weren't producing anymore. They were mainly a brome monoculture and the soil was pretty much dead on them. And, you know, I had this idea of, of what can we do? Can we, uh, can we rebuild these soils and get them back to a more native, native grass state uh, without applying synthetic fertilizers to them? Can we do it naturally and can we graze it? And, you know that was that was the first part of our context was that and the second was can we replace hay feeding here in western south dakota at the same time and and so that's where this idea was born from and um and this talk is a lot about cover crops but uh in the context of it which context i think is maybe the most important soil health principle i um grazing management is what we do and that's our main thing here so this this used to be bare soil here and now we're growing grass we're you know we're taking our focus is growing growing forage and grass for our livestock um and we we build rest and recovery times for our pastures we we uh we calve and sink with nature on stockpiled forage and uh reduce our inputs just as as much as we can and try to get back our operation back to nature um this picture here is uh last january a year ago after a pretty brutal winter and the snow came off and we've got green grass and this this picture summarizes all six soil health principles that we do on our ranch and we're we're pretty excited this is this is so powerful what we're doing and you know with that we're we're able to actually we graze our cows 12 months out of the year um, this is this picture here is is 20 below with a pretty stiff breeze blowing and we're able to graze through it. We provide our cattle with all they need uh, and not in the form of of uh, harvested feed. So in that we we we, uh, we do have a, a forage shortfall in both nutrition and quality and quantity in the middle of the winter. And so that's where the cover crop comes through. And And we started this. We took out some smooth brome monoculture uh, for this grant, and we planted full season, warm season cover crops. And 
this year, this is the first year of the project and these were daily moves uh, on this and um, here's kind of our seed mix that we did this last year. I've, I've been able to play around quite a little with with certain species and find out what seems to work better in our country because we're you know rainfall is our biggest limiting factor and this seed mix works pretty good but um, I typically plant this in uh, in the last half of May and hope to get a rain on it to germinate it and get it through the summer. But uh, th these are some of the pictures then of, of us grazing. This would have been two years ago in November with pears. And this would have been last a year ago. Um, can you guys see these all right? Okay, yes, so, we can. Okay. So this one was last year, a year ago in December, and it's 25 below and, and these cows are grazing just fine. Uh, we actually rolled hay out for them and it laid there for three weeks because uh, it's amazing these cows would rather go graze than, than actually stand around and eat hay. Eat hay. It's kind of like what they were designed to do, I think. Um, this was earlier, this fall, it had been late November of this last fall uh, with pears again. And it's hard to see the calves in there. We grew so much feed. Uh, one guy commented to me, wondering what I was going to do with my weedy sorghum field. Well, <laughs> you guys can see the uh, the diverse mix we got in there, and we had a lot of it. Um, this is a picture of a one very happy cow uh, doing what she was designed to. This was uh, this was last January, and and it was. I think 30 below in this picture and the breeze was blowing and these cows, I couldn't even get a tractor started to feed. Um, and they're, they're just out doing what they love to do. It's pretty amazing. Same, same time frame. So, you know, some of the pushback on, on, well, this, this isn't going to work. Um, you know, what, what if you get a bunch of snow? Well, we've we've had a lot of snow ever since we started this project and we just graze right on through it. You can see in these pictures how much snow there is. Um, and as long as you got enough, if you leave it there, the cows are gonna find it. Uh, the biggest weather damage we get, if you can see in the top right photo, is we get a little bit of wind damage from 50, 60 mile hour wind storms that we end up getting, but it's still, it, it doesn't doesn't seem to affect it at all. Um, and here's, this is the effect, this is herd effect on snow. So we're we're actually moving these cows every three to five days. So we have them pretty contained and the herd effect just busts the snow right up and they, they'll they dig down in there and they'll get every, every last bit that they can. They just love it. Uh, part of it uh, we hear is, uh, um, well, the nutrition's not there. It's going to be weathered. It's going to be. It won't be any good. But here's, here's. Uh, I just I sampled it later this year in January, mid January, and it still has just almost nine percent crude protein, sixty three percent TDN, and a NEG of thirty eight. And it, it weathers a little bit, but boy, it holds its nutrition really well, and it's more than adequate for a mid gestation. Uh, cow in the middle of the winter and they they just really thrive off of it so you know part of this project we did a lot of myth busting on what was out there and and proved them all wrong here's a this picture is a added bonus that uh, by having this on your place you can pull big bucks from every neighbor's place in the valley so that's that's made it fun um, we have had a lot of challenges uh, drought being one of them, our first year was super dry, but we were still pretty successful, I thought. But here was last year, it was germinated good and, and looked great in the end of June, completely hailed us out. And um, here was early August, it bounced right back and, and was just incredible. So uh, part of the deliverables on the grant was we were, we were to have a tour every every year and we did three of them. Here was the flyer from last summer and we had about 85 people show up and it was great. And Tony and Colette came over and we were super excited to have them as well as 
delegates from our uh, congressional representatives and glad to see them there. And to me, guys, this this project is boots on the ground conservation and, you know, to where we can take a concept and and show it to people in, in real time. And, you know, people people are hungry for this knowledge. They, they want to do better. And it's our really our duty to to take it out and show it to them. We're excited to be a part of it. So um, Dr. Chris Nichols was our kind of our keynote speaker last year. It was super hot, but it was great. Uh, everybody learned a ton. And I think I'm the first one to ever get Chris Nichols and Ray Ward in the same soil pit together. And uh, we had some really spirited discussion, but it was great. So uh, thank you for all that were part of that. And so then the question, we'll go to some data here. Um, you know, what about yield? And our first year was our toughest year. Um, but you can see, and, and the, the last years we needed to revise it down just a touch, but our the production's nearly been tripling on it every year. And we may have reached the upper end of our production, but, you know, I fully attribute that to soil health because it's surely not moisture because in the difference between year one and year two, we actually year two had two and a half inches less precipitation and we grew three times as much forage. So pretty exciting stuff there. Um, if, if we look at the data purely on an organic matter level, it's kind of disappointing because actually the organic matter went down. But part of this project, we were we we sampled the cover crop fields as well as the hay fields. And if you look on the hay field side, if you can see it, the organic matter went down in the hay fields as well. So I think that organic matter varies quite a little, and I think moisture and you know our environment has a lot to do with it. So I'm actually going to uh, continue this project on my own for at least two more years before we plant it back to native because I'd really like to see a hard trend line on this to what it's actually doing. And in the grand scheme of things, three years is not much because we've really been, we've taken from this land for, for generations and three years isn't enough to give back. But uh, if we look over here, the one really exciting thing that sticks out to me on this cover crop field is if you look over at total organic carbon and it went up exponentially. So the question of, are we storing carbon in the ground? Absolutely, the proof's right there. Um, we look at the hay field as well, <clears throat> and our total organic carbon went up as, on that as well, but actually I grazed these hay fields the first two years of the project. And I think this is pretty hard proof that gra grazing and proper grazing management will add and sequester carbon to the ground. We need to do some more studying on that, but you know the results are there on that. So the really exciting part was uh, the PLFAs, the soil, the, the biological component of the soil test. And you know we had a we started out with very low uh, populations, and then with a little moisture, it just exploded. And part of that was eating up the the root the root structure of the bro monoculture that flushed it. But if you guys look down, if you can see the total fungi of it, there was hardly anything to begin with. And it went up exponentially up just like a rocket from, if you look on the left, cover crop field from about 40 up over 500. And the hay field went the same. And I, I attribute that to grazing on that. That's, that's pretty exciting stuff to see that. And that was our goal was to, if we can bring the fungi back and we did. and very exciting. Everybody wants to know the economics. So here's kind of what we did last year. I run through and, and you can there's multiple ways to break this down to dollars, but uh, we achieved about 125 animal units per acre last year, which is pretty, pretty high. Um, our costs are about $100 an acre, which we include opportunity cost on the land of about 40 bucks an acre to that. So that comes to about 80, 80 cents an animal unit. So if you break that out to what a cow is, it's costing me a little over a buck a day to uh, to graze these cows through the winter versus 
if we're feeding 200 plus dollar of hay, by the time we get it to the cow, it's costing us four bucks. So right there, we could be saving about 75% of our winter hay, winter feeding costs, which anybody in the cow-calf business knows that's our mo usually our largest cost in producing a calf is our winter feed. Um, this year we had we had calves on the cows for a little bit and then we weaned them and put them back on. So I estimated they gained about two and a half pounds a day, which the first year of the project, they gained just almost three. Uh, this year, the quality was down just a little bit. So I estimated that at 275 a pound for, for 30 days, we figure we increased the value of our calf by about $200. If you break that down to what that costs on the calf side, it was about 40 cents a day to run a calf on this 550 pound calf. That makes our cost to gain about 32 cents per pound versus if I had them in the feedlot, it would be it would vary from a dollar twenty to upwards of a dollar eighty, depending on where you're at. Those are significant savings. Um, so if you figure all this kind of together, I estimate that the net profit per acre on this is about 400 bucks. Um, that's tremendous. Uh, there's no no farm fields in the country that are going to net maybe $400 an acre. And we're doing this with very little inputs and with cows. Uh, we've, by grazing management and the cover crops, we've we've only fed about 20 bales through this entire winter. To our cow herd, we've slashed our direct costs and our kept our overheads down, and that's how we're bringing profit back into our business. And we're we're very successful at this. Uh, we're still got to go through all the economics to to kind of wrap this project up. But one thing that I'm struggling with, and uh, if anybody can help, uh, what is the value to add to the the profit per acre of the nutrients that we recycle back? And I think that number is is very, very large. So I guess in short, does this work? Absolutely. And you know, we've we've got the proof of it. It's we're beyond the experimental stage and when we're so so excited about this. So uh here's my contact info. Uh if if you guys want to reach out, feel free. And I just want to thank everybody on the project. And Kent Cooley and Valerie Ryder have, have been there every step of the way and have helped me along. And we appreciate those guys. And and thank you, everybody from State NRCS. So any Bradley, questions? Great presentation. Thank you for, for sharing. And it. it's, it's quite an inspirational story, really. So thank you. Thank you. And really Tony. appreciate all the, all, the, all the data you're gathering for us, too. That's, that's awesome. Cool. Is there, is there a way we can come up with a value on, on how much nutrients? Uh, we've talked about it multiple times, but yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, Pete, did you have your hand up? Yeah, I'm going to just comment on basically how Tony started this meeting and, and Riley, thanks you and Jimmy. That was excellent. I've seen your presentation a couple times now and it's where we need to go with a lot of this. If you if you look at what I presented ahead of Riley, and we've got all those go back fields out there right now. They're targeted for they're going to be the first things targeted for recropping across all these landscapes. And we know that um, Riley and Jimmy have showed an alternative. Um, and of course, there's been grant support there, but I guess I want to challenge us all to think very deeply about this on in the future. And Riley, this is probably going to sound weird coming from me. Um, I'm pretty much a prairie purist. Um, and I love the idea that you want to go back to natives. But I also really think about ranch economics and I want to I want this group to think about. So if you go back to a pure, you know, those of us that are understand grazing, if you go back to a pure native stand, it's wonderful for the landscape and stuff. But is it going to actually help carry the the ranch? You know, using your ranch as an example, Riley over that winter period right and we don't have to get into this entire conversation right now but i do think we need to mark this tony as a, the next big point that we need to do in the progression of how we're helping and working with producers on this because i, I like i said it's going to sound weird coming from me but i'm not sure that's the very best immediate future for a ranch um 
I think that there's balance that we could discuss in future programs that allows producers this mix of perennial and annual covers and forages on those old go back fields because look at what we're already seeing for soil health we're meeting crp requirements even you know i'm, I'm gonna use crp as an example with the soil health benefit and all the wildlife and all that stuff comes by happenstance but i worry about ranch economics in the long run um without that safe without that relief valve you know that these guys have already shown and that others have shown as well so I, i'd like to note that as a challenge for us here in south dakota I would much rather see a restorative, regenerative reprocessing of these old fields than leaving them subject to a decision that says, gosh, I have to go to natives or else I have to break it and go to crops. And uh, non-invasive short and long-term covers and perennials might really, really be that sweet spot for people to stay productive and profitable. So I just want to, I want to share that, I guess. Thank you, Pete. Um, are there any other, um, anyone else have their hand up or comments? Questions for Jimmy and Riley? Okay, well, thank you very, very much for sharing your story. We really appreciate it. Really appreciate thank you, it. everybody. Thank you. Awesome. Okay. So, um, under this portion of the, of the agenda, we are addressing like conservation practices and topics. And the next on the agenda, we have our uh, an update with uh, South Dakota Technical Guide, and that is with uh, Jim Reedy, our state conservation engineer. So I'll turn it to you, Jim. Then after that, we're going to go to Owen over at the Farm Service Agency. Thanks, Colette. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I just want to say how excited I am to hear how we're using LIDAR. We are using LIDAR, Pete. That excites me a lot. <laughs> Being an engineer, LIDAR is just near and dear to my heart. So it's kind of neat to see those different ways that our partners are using that resource. That's very cool. And I have a family, my family ranch is out by Phillips. So seeing what Riley's doing with the forages and the cover crops and the soil health and all that grazing improvement is just huge. So I'm, those were awesome presentations. Thank you very much. I'm gonna share my screen real quick. I just wanted to show, we have a few tech guide updates I wanted to make sure all our partners were aware of. All right, can you folks see that? Yes, Jim, I'm sorry. Yes, we can see it. Okay, okay, thanks. All right, so this is our South Dakota Field Office Tech Guide, our electronic field office tech guide. And just here between the last technical committee meeting and this one, we had uh, three new tech guide notices come out about some uh, standard drawing specifications and a few of our design tools. And it's in section one. If we move down to notices, we have notices posted for every fiscal year. So fiscal year 2024, these are notices uh, 514, 515, and 516. And I just wanted to point out here in 514, we had some updates to uh, revisions and a new uh, standard job plan. And uh, there, there were a few revisions here. Uh, one was with our wildlife escape ladder in our stock tanks. And then we added a new one here real quick. I won't read all this stuff to everybody, but I'll at least point out that you can find these tech guide notices there. We also added a new one for these precast apron sections that we can place around stock water tanks. I'm kind of excited about this one. We have uh, some suppliers out there who are pouring concrete apron sections uh, off site at a facility, and then they're taking them out to the field and then placing them around tanks. So we uh, developed a new standard job plan for that that I think our partners will find handy. Also in Tech Guide Notice 515, this is applicable to section four, where we keep all of our conservation practices and our specifications. Uh, we added a new specification for the use of what we call just fiberglass reinforcement. It's called GFRP, the GFRP bars in our concrete. Uh, we have a new specification for that. And then there were a few uh, revisions and updates made to a couple of our other specs. And the last one, because I know that some of our partners like uh, Game Fish and Parks, and Ducks Unlimited, uh, those folks are all doing uh, livestock pipeline design work, maybe some grass waterway design work. And I wanted to point out, we had a couple of updates to our 
design tool spreadsheets that we use for those. A major update to our grass waterway design tool, uh, kind of a new look and feel to that tool with some additions there and new references to a couple of our specs that were updated for uh, SD27 for waterway and 28 for seeding. And then the livestock pipeline tool, uh, we had an update to the apron tab with uh, rebar spacing. So I just wanted to be sure I pointed those out to everybody who uses these tools. And with that, that's pretty much all I had. If I had any questions, I'd take them. Otherwise, I'll turn it over to you, Colette. Very good, any questions for Jim? Very good, thank you very much. Um, that uh, concludes the conservation practices section of our agenda. We're going to move into the conservation programs area. And with our guest today, we have a farm service agency and, and Owen Megerhoff is going to speak on the Conservation Reserve Program. Turn it to you, Owen, then after you, we'll move to our NRCS uh, Conservation Programs. All right. Thanks, Colette. Um, prior to today's call, um, we did get a notice issued on one of our signups that I'll speak about today on some results and kind of a direction that we're headed. Uh, but I guess first off, just to summarize, we basically got three suites of options right now for CRP signups. Uh, we've got the continuous CRP signup, and we've got the general CRP signup that concludes this Friday, the 29th, to have offers submitted. And we have an upcoming grassland CRP signup that's targeted for the end of the month in April, I believe starting on around April 29th. Um, the ones we got the results on today was under the continuous signup. It's unique this year. Uh, previously, county offices were free to approve as offers became complete and get the start dates identified and move forward with conservation planning and all those things. Uh, but with the extension of the Farm Bill, the national office is now doing batching phases. Uh, so our first batch process, sign up started January 12th and we went through March 15th. All offers that were in a submitted status at that date were looked at and determined if acceptable. And basically all we were determining is that we didn't exceed our acreage cap for our, our national acreage cap under CRP. Um, the notice that was issued this morning Everything that was in that submitted status was accepted in under the continuous sign up under that first batch. Anything submitted after March 15th, uh, the next batch process is going to be April 12th. And then the next one subsequent to that is May 10th. So we've got two additional batching dates in our near future for the continuous sign up. Um, so those are. I guess competing for acres along with the general and the upcoming grassland sign up. Um, grassland, or not sorry, general is not as prevalent in South Dakota. It definitely has its place, uh, but our continuous sign up with our safe practices and our all of our wetland practices addressing the, the prairie pothole region are definitely the, the stronger sign up for South Dakota. Um, again, general sign up that date is March 29th for the last day to accept offers under the general. So we got one day left in that. And then, um, as I spoke to the grassland sign up starts April 29th. There was a notice issued that I want to touch on with the kind of the state tech committee just to put it on record that we reviewed it with the state tech, uh, but we did have the chore as an agency with FSA to uh, to review our grassland priority zone. Um, I'm going to share a map here quickly. So this is the priority zone that was in effect for sign up 205 and forward. So it will be in effect again uh, for for this upcoming sign up. But ultimately the targeted counties, the, the pasture, the hayland, the grass acres in those counties could not exceed 25% of the total grass acres in the state. And these were the 
counties targeted with uh, consultation with Game Fish and Parks, NRCS as kind of our little sub CRP committee. Um, as you can see up there, it's 7,089,395 acres that were targeted in those counties as eligible grassland acres for sign up. And I think our total um, as a state that we could get up to is 7 million and 100, 100 and some thousand. So we're 20 some thousand acres away from our total eligibility. Uh, the difficulties were that we have to target whole counties. We can't take portions of counties to, to maximize that acreage in its entirety. Um, but ultimately, this will be the layer or the, the priority areas. They'll get a few additional points if they make an offer under the grassland sign up going forward into our upcoming grassland uh, sign up that starts April 29th. Um, we did look just kind of high level overview, you know, swapping out some counties, maybe maximizing some other areas in the state. But based off our prior sign up successes, I will make note that our highest enrollment counties under the grassland CRP are West River. And as you can see by the map, get no additional priority points, but we do have the highest amount of acres um, out West under our grassland sign up. Uh, so again, I think the discussion last year was to target our, our expiring CRPs, um, probably our highest threat of conversion potentially would be in these eastern counties where crop production is more prevalent and so wanted to incentivize those counties uh, with a little extra incentive to rank higher to get accepted under the grassland sign up. Um, so this will be the, the priority zone moving forward again, uh, but just wanted to review with the state tech committee to make that noted. Um, any questions, comments, concerns for myself? Thanks, Colette. Oh, Pete's maybe got his hand up again. Go ahead, Pete. Yeah, just in relation to the things we've already discussed today, um, I would in the past, you know, I've been part of that selection committee and I, or that priority zone committee, and I think that. I think that we've always thought about that and in, in maybe in the correct way. I'm starting to question that a little bit on grassland CRP anymore, given the the, the data that we've, you know, we've, you know, of course, there's you can't do nothing about it now, but I think, you know, as a team, we might want to think about this a little bit more strategically because our conversion of natives are clearly, I mean, we've got conversion to East River, no doubt, especially as we push that out toward the river. But I think if we're giving priority points um, and we're really targeting grassland CRP and we're really actually wanting to focus on keeping grass underfoot versus necessarily, you know, uh, crop fields, we may need to think about that in the future. Um, we may actually want to think about putting a, a point benefit closer to the river and West River on grassland CRP, but it's something for our subcommittee to think about, I think, in the future. So I just wanted to share that. Thanks, Pete. Thank you. Uh, any other questions for us? Before we move on to the NRCS contribution programs update. Okay, very good, Val. Then I'm gonna welcome our newest member of our leadership team to the, the floor. Val, I'll turn it to you for a programs update, please. Thank you, Colette. Um, hi, I'm Val DeBrees. I'm the newest member to the leadership team, as uh, Colette said. I'm the, I've got some big shoes to fill. I'm uh, filling Jeff Van Gold's prior position, so I've got a really great team, and I look forward to serving you in this capacity. I've been with the NRCS for about 20 years. I served a field position, an area position. I was prior to the, the state uh, conservation stewardship program manager. So I am happy to be here. I'm excited about uh, programs moving forward. We've got lots of opportunities. And like I said, we've got a really great team that offer a nice suite of programs, guidance, and support. So um, relative to programs, we're kind of in the middle of trying to to um, look at rankings. Um, we did a little thing different this year relative to our ranking process. We're trying to do a continuous ranking and having um, 
pre-approval batches. So in January, we had a pre-approval opportunity for offices that had applications ranked that were above um, the thresholds. And then we uh, attempted the same process in February, March. We've got this process in place through May. We're hopeful to have obligations done by uh, late May. So, um, you know, I think we're making good progress and I've got some program managers on the call today that are going to give their individual updates. So with that, uh, I've got Jen on the program first. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Jennifer Wirtz. I am the EQIP program manager for the state. And I don't have any handouts to share with you today. Like like Val said, we're in the process of going through batchings of pre-approvals. Uh, knowing that we have, uh, you know, looking at the numbers, we have, will not have any problems spending the $37 million in equip allocation uh, that we did get this year. Uh, one thing that uh, was new this year was the grass, uh, excuse me, Great Plains Grassland Initiative that we are starting. We just ended the sign up here and they were ranking applications that were received. That that initiative is targeted towards cedar encroachments, uh, especially along the lower Missouri area. Uh, so we have ample interest in that as well. And I don't believe we'll have any lack of, of applications for that allocation of about five million or excuse me five hundred thousand uh, dollars again we split up uh, split up funding pools by ira funding and general classic funding and some of our cis projects that we've had in the past have gone to ira pro, uh, funding as well as uh you know, some of them that wouldn't fit that criteria have stayed in the classic funding. So again, I we don't anticipate any problems spending the, the, the money that we got. We actually did ask for a little additional money. Uh, and if there's any questions on EQIP, let me know. Uh, and, you know, going off of the presentations we've had so far, I, I think we need to have a visit with Riley and maybe look at a new initiative for the state. So. Great. Thanks, Jim. Um, I'm going to present on the CSP update. Uh, that's ne next on the agenda. And, um, you know, I echo a lot of what Jen had shared about the different fund pools. Uh, we're working through the pre-approval pre process. I would say that um, we've got about half of our applications pre-approved for CSP that we're going to pre-approve for the year. So we've, we've gone through about half of our funding or thereabouts. Um, offices are still ranking. We've had a successful CSP application period. Uh, we've got more, far more applications than we have funding. Um, you know, we have some really great opportunities. So as you are out and about, uh, please share that, you know, the agency has good program opportunities and we're open for applications all year long. So. Uh, we're like I said, we're hopeful to have our obligations wrapped up by the end of May and and start planning for fiscal 25. So um, I'll ask David Flannery. He's our acting easement program manager to share that ASAP report. Good morning, everybody. Um, as Val said, I am David Flannery, the acting easement program manager for South Dakota. I have a couple of attachments I will share my screen and uh, go over. All right, did that come through for everybody? Yes. Okay, so first update, uh, we, since our last state tech meeting, we did get our FY24 uh, South Dakota Geographic area rate caps or GARC rates approved for WRE. Um, a few notable changes. We were able to um, increase our rate not to exceed for any offers that require appraisals up to $9,500 an acre. Previously, that has been sitting around the uh, anywhere between $5,500 and $6,500 um, area in the past. So going forward, 
for anything that requires an appraisal, uh, we will be able to be a bit more competitive uh, with the the market rates that are out there being so high. Uh, in the past, we did have a number of um, easement offers that went out, had appraisals, and were ultimately declined because they just weren't able to to compete with the appraised amount. Um, in addition to that, we did we were able to increase some of our rates to become more competitive with this uh, pretty volatile uh, real estate market. Uh, to note, down in the the Brookings, Minnehaha, um, and Lincoln County areas in the uh, southeast, um, we're up into the six and seven thousand dollar an acre categories for crop ground. Um, one thing to note is we do have a few um, counties and some of our regions that have appraisals noted for non-crop acres, and uh, that that came because our appraisers that did the area-wide market analysis were not uh, finding enough data for sales for non-crop ground in those areas in the time period. Um, that they're able to use for their market research. Um, by the time that came to light, we didn't really have enough time to go to the National Appraiser's Office and request a um, waiver to extend those windows. Uh, we were already waiting quite a while um, on comments and feedback from the National Office on that. So in order to be able to move forward a little bit more efficiently on our fiscal year timelines, we elected to uh, switch some of those to just require an appraisal. And it, uh, in the end, it turned out um, that we didn't actually need to exercise any of those uh, non-crop ground appraisals. So that, that went into the decision to do that as we were uh, noting that it was gonna be a pretty minimal uh, additional workload so that's the route we went. This will be included as an attachment for anybody who needs to reference it. Um, and it should be available on our website as well. Moving on from there, um, I'm not sure why this is showing up as equip because I definitely saved it as an ASAP uh, attachment. And I was looking at that before I went on. Um, this is a, a breakdown of where we're sitting at for our fiscal year 24 ASAP. Um, applications and acquisitions. So for fiscal year 2024, um, we were sitting pretty low compared to years past. And I think that's largely due to how dry things have been lately. Um, we only had 31 WRE applications total. Now we do take that times two in a sense because we do rank for both farm bill funding and for IRA funding. However, um, as I would have mentioned previously, but for those who are not aware, unlike the other Farm Bill programs, ASEP is looked at and ranked and selected nationally for IRA funds. For WRE, we did not receive any funding for fiscal year 24, and we did not also for fiscal year 23. So everything that we're looking at that we're acquiring this year will be through Farm Bill funds. Where we're sitting now is we have five offers for WRE that we are moving forward with, all have elected to continue, and we're working towards um, the next steps to get to our agreement to purchase. We had one applicant that is a permanent with reserve grazing rights. We have two that are permanent. We have one offer that was a 30 year with reserve grazing rights, and we have one 30 year easement that we are converting to permanent. Uh, that's for a total of about 621 acres, a little over $2.7 million uh, for five total tentative agreements. Uh, worth noting, we left a fair bit of wiggle room in our budget because one of our permanent offers does require an appraisal. So we we anticipate that will come in over the GARC rates, so we wanted to leave some buffer in there to be sure that we're going to be sitting all right on that. I have a little bit of a simpler breakdown for our agricultural land land easements, ALE. We did have two funded applications through the National IRA uh, fund pool. That is for a total of 6,724 acres at $2.87 million. So we're pretty excited about that as well as our entities and landowners. And we've been moving through the process with that. We are working 
with the uh, easement acquisition branch with national headquarters uh, to acquire those. And we are actually working with Jeff Vanderwilt's team. Uh, so we have a familiar face that we're working with at headquarters to move these through. And from here for FY24 through the end of the Inflation Reduction Act, any ASAP applications that come through, we will work hand in hand with the easement acquisition branch with headquarters to, to be able to hopefully move those through very efficiently. Um, and then to wrap up this report, we have, as of right now, um, we are going to be making an offer for one more ALE application uh, for another 923 acres at $562,000. The offer letter for that will be going out either this week or early next and uh, hope to proceed with that. I believe that is all I've got. Uh, if anybody has any questions, go ahead and. Um, Put those in the chat to raise your hand and I'm happy to answer those. Hearing none so far, I will uh, let us carry on. Thanks everybody. Thank you, David. I appreciate it. Uh, and thanks to David too. He's in an acting role and uh, we get to keep him for a bit. We hope to hire an act, uh, easement program manager here soon. So we're just getting some paperwork back and hope to make selections. Uh, so uh, Matt Warlock is our RCPP coordinator and I'll turn it over to him. All right, good morning everybody. Um, much like Jen, I've been in the middle of uh, batching periods and pre-approvals and then negotiating ongoing agreements with new projects. So I didn't have a chance to get any handouts put together for everybody. Um, what I want to do is give a verbal rundown of both projects that are ongoing right now with activities and then so where we're at on the projects that were funded over the last um, NFO opportunity. So um, with the current existing projects, um, the Big Sioux Watershed shed Project, which is along the Big Sioux River Corridor along I-90, um, they had their first bashing period, uh, which closed about a month ago. And during that, we had there was nine applications that came in. I mean, we were able to fund eight projects um, with that batching period for a total of about $350,000 worth of grazing systems and things like that. Um, the remaining one that wasn't funded is actually going to be funded through EQIP instead. So all nine of those applications were funded. Um, we, we have about a year left of that project, so we're actually going to be opening up a second batching period. Or in fact, it just opened up um, and it's going to be operating now until May 3rd. So if you know any producers in that big shed watershed, that big Sioux River watershed, um, let them know that there's an opportunity to enroll. Um, there's gonna be about $600,000 available for funding uh, financial assistance with this next batching period. Um, we're going through a process of moving some TA, technical assistance and funds over to FA, which is bumping that up um, so we have a little bit more money available to producers there. Um, with project 2276, which is the Lewis and Clark and Lower James River project, um, they held their first batching period um, and it just finished up um, and they had five applications for egg waste systems come in with that project um, for just over 2.2 million dollars um, and their initial financial assistance allocation was only for two million um, so we were able to fund four of the five projects um, with about 1.8 million dollars in funding there um, but uh, we met with a partner the other day and they also are going to be moving some of their technical assistance that they feel like they don't need over to financial assistance. So we're going to be able to pick up that fifth project and fund all of them um, with this. So with one batching period, we were able to use up all the funding with pride with that Lewis and Clark project, which is great to hear. Um, it's all egg waste systems um, and we're going to be able to fund 200 or 2.25 million dollars in projects with that one um, and wrap that up. So. Um, lastly, we have an ongoing bashing period in the Northeast Glacier Lakes project. Um, that period, it's open until April 5th, um, and there's $1.7 million available for producers up in that Northeast corner of the state. Um, it includes parts of Marshall, Day, Roberts, Grant, and Kyneton counties. So if you know anybody up in that northern end of the Big Sioux watershed too, um, let them know there's an opportunity there. Um, there's about $1.7 million, like I said, available, and that batching window closes April 5th. Um, so that's what's going on with current active projects out there. Um, a lot of good work going on, um, a lot of interest. I mean, I was really encouraged to see, especially with that Lewis and Clark and Lord James project, that there was enough 
interest to fund all the or use all the financial assistance in one batching period. Um, so there's a lot of interest out there from producers. Uh, moving on to the new projects that were funded on the previous NFO. I'm just kind of an update so you guys all know where they're at in the in the scheme of things. Um, the South Dakota Grasslands Initiative, which is an AFA project with Ducks Unlimited, and we were able to get the, the partnership agreement finished um, and signed off by NHQ and Tony and Ducks Unlimited have signed those, that project, so it's active um, and ready to go. We're in the process currently of negotiating their supplemental agreement for financial assistance. Um, so once we get that finished up, they'll be able to sign up producers and get rolling on it. Um, so that one's moving along pretty quickly. Along with the South Dakota Land Trust Conservation Easement in Northern Great Plains, um, we were able to get that partnership agreement through NHQ already as well. Um, so it's active and we're going to begin the supplemental agreements next week um, to make sure that that one's going to be going on as well um, as fast as we can. I know there's a lot of interest to do some easement work along the front front edge of the Black Hills and we're hopefully be able to meet that demand soon. Um, the Making Sure of Acre Counts project with SDSU, um, that programmatic agreement has been submitted to headquarters. Um, we're hopefully going to hear back here next week, within the next week on whether or not they're ready to move that on to signing um, and get that project going as well too. So a lot of movement on those projects and we're through the, the partnership agreement side of things in record time. Um, it was nice to see we were able to get through the process quicker. There's been some changes done at headquarters to make sure that they don't take so long to get through that step and it's, it's working. Um, we're a couple months in, we've already got three of them almost the signature stage or at the signature stage. So the RCPV program is moving faster than it historically did, which is good to hear. Um, on Monday, we received some additional good news. Um, AgriPure Dairy Best Management Project um, was tentatively accepted with the last NFO um, and with some changes to um, what they're looking at doing and removing some feed additive work that hasn't cleared FDA yet. Um, the chief announced that he was willing to, or we were going to sign that agreement um, and make it active. So that's another project that's coming on board with about $9 million in financial assistance um, to dairy producers in the state uh, working with AgriPure um, and doing greenhouse gas emission work. So um, that was just announced the other day. Um, so we're excited to bring that to, to life and get that program act active as well. So that's kind of where those projects were at um, that were signed up on our last NFO. The reason I bring that up is because we have a new national funding opportunity that's going to be coming out in the next couple of weeks. Um, so I want everybody to be thinking about that. Um, as Tony said earlier, with this IRA funding that's coming out, we have an opportunity with a lot of additional funding. Um, historically, NFOs that were just dealing with farm bill funds, it was, they were about the size of $200 million. Um, and that's what an NFO would go out for annually. Um, with this IRA funding, this next NFO that's coming out is going to be for $1.7 to $1.8 billion. Um, so that's a lot of additional money coming out that we have an opportunity to grab in the state. Um, obviously, that's a nationwide amount, but you know, being competitive as we are in South Dakota, hopefully we can bring a majority of that to our state. Um, so there's a huge opportunity coming out and that would, is made possible um, through a, that additional IRA funding. Um, so we're hoping, like I said, there was just a call that went on um, at 10 o'clock and I got a note from one of my counterparts in their state that they're hoping that that NFO is going to come out either the first or second week of April. It's just getting through those last hurdles up in Washington, D.C. Um, and getting blessed by the White House and other places. So hopefully in the next two weeks, we're going to see that new NFO come out. So any of you partners on the call that are looking at a new project, make sure to reach out to myself or Tony um, and we will sit down and we'll, let's come up with a project that we can we can do. So with that, I just want to wrap up with a, a quick thank you. Um, I glossed over it quickly, but um, we had two of the partners, you know, John Parker at Minnehaha Conservation District and then Rocky Knippling at James River Water Development District that both of them stepped up with their projects and they're willing to take some technical assistance that they could receive in funding and move those that money over to financial assistance, which means more projects on the ground for the state. So I just want to say thank you to those two if they're on the call. Um, and stepping up and, and putting our producers first um, and taking some of that technical assistance money that you guys could receive and putting that in the ground. Um, we have the demand in the state, so um, having partners like that to, that are willing to step aside and put more money in the ground to the producers, um, that goes a long ways for our state and that demonstrates why our state is so strong. So just want to say thank you to those folks quick. And with that, I'll turn it back over um, unless there's any questions for me. Thank you, Matt.
I appreciate it. Um, if there's any questions for any of the program side of things, we sure provide a brief opportunity for those now. All right, Colette, I'll turn it back to you. Very good. Well, thank you for the uh, information on the conservation programs. Um, then we also have uh, in the uh, handouts, um, I want to remind everyone that Randy had um, put in the chat the PDF with the handouts for the meeting for today, um, if you want to revisit that. Um, and there was, there was a report that David had in there. And then also our next topic is the wetland and highly erodible workload update. Uh, that report is in the handouts as well. And then um, moving into um, a grievance update. So I didn't put the whole announcement in there, but there is the cover page for our conservation, uh, South Dakota Conservation Collaboration Cooperative Agreement. So we currently have this uh, opportunity open right now, and it is um, applications are due through um, grants.gov by April 29th. Uh, last year we had 22 proposals um, and that was really exciting to see that. So I'm hoping this year that we also have some really great proposals come in. Um, and again, I encourage everyone to uh, be sure to make sure if you're going to apply um, that your grants.gov account is up to date uh, with all your credentials. And also on grants.gov, there are, are many other opportunities for, for federal financial assistance for uh, local projects. And uh, one of them I wanted to bring to attention is the um, USDA's Urban Agriculture and Innovative Production Grants. Um, I have a, a note in the uh, agenda for that, but on grants.gov, you can find that, um, that topic. And with the priorities of our agency, you know, urban agriculture is well, one of them. Um, and I think about, you know, my brain goes to Sioux Falls, Rapid City, obviously, those urban areas, but I also think about um, communities. There's a lot of opportunity in smaller communities of South Dakota for agriculture within um, urban or suburban or smaller community areas. Um, very exciting news, too. A third thing that I want to bring your attention is that we also um, had gotten just noticed just uh, yesterday that the um, USDA NRCS nationally has posted on grants.gov the Grazing Lands Conservation Initiative funding opportunity. So I would very much encourage you to um, check through that opportunity for um, anything related to grazing lands. And those are due May 26th. Okay, um, at this point, um, we have a round robin of conservation partnership updates. This is a real fun section too. Unfortunately, on the agenda, there were two ladies that had to um, go to another meeting. So I'm going to go over to the Department of Agriculture and Natural Resources as our first guest on the partnership part of this um, sharing. Okay, um, real quick though, were there any questions on anything covered to date before I move into partner updates? Sounds good. Certainly put it in the chat or we can follow up later too as well. So Chris, um, I'll let you introduce yourself and uh, proceed with your report. Yeah, hello, I'm Chris Dozark. I work for the Watershed Protection Program uh, with the Department of Ag and Natural Resources. Um, I'm technically our implementation team leader slash 319 coordinator. Uh, Section 319 is a part of the Clean Water Act. So it's kind of cool to hear about the RCPPs. Um, they're very uh, a great partner for our watershed projects. And I think almost all of them uh, have an RCPP, uh, including uh, the James River, Big Sioux, Northeast Glacial Lakes, Belfouche River. So uh, it's a cool partnership to see. Um, but I guess today, I'll share my screen here. <clears throat> Everybody see that? Okay, so yes. um, in 2021, I just want to bring uh, this to everybody's attention as a uh, possible help to funding or additional incentive to some different uh, things across the state. So in 2020, uh, the Department of Ag and Natural Resources was awarded uh, $3 million from House Bill 1256, um, basically to help clean up the Big Sioux River. Um, and with that, um, using what's been very successful with the Big Sioux River Watershed Project, 
Um, they call it SRAM, but we kind of uh, kind of took from them a little bit and came up with this repairing buffer incentive. Um, and it 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 was pretty slow, pretty slow going until we made a couple of changes uh, a year or so ago, um, and basically. Um, Game Fish and Parks was kind of working on some crap in Game Fish uh, in the Big Sioux River, um, and we we thought, well, why why try and compete? Why not uh, you know maybe throw an extra incentive on top of you know, what they were doing? So we um, yeah basically came up with this uh, extra incentive to where we'll pay basically 120 percent of the federal weighted average or you know what the CRP rates would be on the first uh, 120 feet of this repairing buffer. So um, we kind of uh, went with that and it's been pretty successful um, in the Big Sioux River. Um, yeah, so in the handouts, uh, just to bring to your attention, um, we kind of, there's some examples there um, of what's possible uh, to do. And then along with that, we uh, applied for some ARPA funds um, through our department and ended up getting a million dollars and decided to take this uh, statewide. Um, and we kind of decided that uh, we've had some really good working relationships in the Big Sioux River, um, working with uh, Ducks Unlimited, Pheasants Forever, Game Fish and Parks, um, some NRCS folks have all come um, asking questions about RBI. So uh, we decided to kind of take this and go statewide with it. So I just wanted to bring that to everybody's attention um, that this would be a possibility, um, you know, with some CRP contracts or CREP contracts um, statewide that um, we're gonna kind of throw this money as an incentive to you know, if somebody's kind of on the fence and they're looking for, you know, that extra little boost, uh, maybe this would be a possibility. So, um, like I said, there's three fact sheets in the handouts. Um, they can explain it a lot better than I can at this point. Um, and uh, if anybody has any questions or anything, you can definitely let me know. Um, or Tanner Clausen, he's kind of our, our point of contact for the RBI project repairing buffer initiative. Uh, and you can find this stuff also on our website um, underneath the watershed protection program uh, website. So um, at that at this point, I guess I'll I'll stop jabbering on and see if anybody has any questions. Great, those are exciting opportunities. Thank you very much, Chris. So awesome. OK, great. Um, well, on our call today, um, there is a lady that's uh, new to our uh, group, too. Her name is Rachel Bush. And um, I'm going to ask you, Rachel, if you wanted to go ahead and, and take the mic today and introduce yourself. And after Rachel, uh, we'll go over to um, Blaine Bracky, please. Thanks, Colette. Yeah, Rachel Bush, I am uh, the new Grassland Strategy Director for the Nature Conservancy. Uh, I've been in this position since about mid-December, but even since that time, I've recognized a lot of faces and names on this call. So, but I appreciate the invite and the opportunity to introduce myself. Um, I guess just, you know, a few updates from the Nature Conservancy there that's happening in South Dakota. Um, I know most of you or many of you probably know Joe Blastic. He is just, you know, he asked me to remind everybody that the fire schools are going to be starting here in April um, and going into May. And those, you know, everybody I think should have seen those flyers for those. Um, just an update too. Uh, thanks for the update on the programs. I know the Nature Conservancy ourselves worked with three ALE applicants. Um, at this point, none of them, you know, were selected for funding. Um, we do know that, you know, one of those applications is under direct threat of development around the Black Hills and two of them, you know, were working ranches. Um, and we also, you know, we know there's a lot of interest out there for ALE. Um, just, you know, as a point we know, you know, I know Matt Morlock mentioned RCPP. We know that's an option um, and one we're considering, but I also think it's worth pointing out that with RCPP, you know, those landowners are only going to receive 50% of that easement value. 
um, as opposed to the 75 if funding were to go through. Um, so I just think it's, you know, I'm just saying that so that you guys understand there's increased interest or, you know, interest out there for increased funding through ALE. Um, and then I guess just an update on some of our Western South Dakota work. Um, our, our Western South Dakota program has added two additional riparian restoration specialists. Those positions are going to be really working closely with NRCS field staff, um, conservation partners, and uh, local landowners to provide that technical assistance and support for a variety of riparian health and grazing management projects. Um, those positions are going to be based in Rapid City, um, but they're available to support projects throughout West River. Um, we also have uh, three uh, riparian health workshops planned for the summer. Dates haven't been determined yet, but as soon as we get those um, dates set and locations set, we'll make sure we share it with um, NRCS and the partners. But that's my update from TNC, and um, thanks for letting me join, and happy to be working with this group. Well, welcome to South Dakota. We appreciate your uh, um, multi-state perspectives and, and assistance. Awesome. Okay. Um, Blaine, I'm going to go over to you and let you introduce yourself and tell us about your new project. Hey, thanks, Colette. Um, so I'm my name is Blaine Brackey. I work with the uh, SDACD, South Dakota Association of Conservation Districts, and NRCS on a grant, the locally led um, project. And we are pretty excited to announce we just launched a new website um, called the Dakota Conservation Network. I will share my screen here quick um, and show a little flyer that we have. Um, and I will post this flyer in the um, in the chat also. But um, I guess for those on the call, um, if you have any. So what this website is, is basically um, it's a hub of all the conservation resources um, in the state, <clears throat> in the state where we've been running for about two weeks, um, really about a week and uh, kind of starting to get programs and, and resources loaded onto it. Um, but for those of you that haven't heard me talk about this, um, it is partner driven. So if you have uh, resources or programs um, or events to add to it, it is set up in a way that um, you can go fill out a form um, and add your program or resource to it. Um, and this is the website uh, homepage here. Um, and to add a program, you would just go up here in the top left um, to the add help button. Um, and a form comes up. Um, if your organization or agency is in there, um, I've loaded a few of them in there, but obviously there's still a lot um, that I haven't. Um, you would just add a new agency um, and just kind of go through the um, as little or as much as you'd like to add, um, you know, the counties that that your program or resources in and submit um, without taking, you know, a good half hour of all your guys' time for it. I just wanted a quick um, show you this new resource where it, I mean, it's brand spanking new, um, you know, we're just kind of starting to get it rolling. So any um, any help anybody on this call can provide as far as putting, you know, their resources in there, programs, um, any other information, um, we please encourage you to, to do so and reach out with any questions or or more information or feedback on kind of the um, how the website works. We're looking for um, any and everything you guys can all give us. So. Um, with that, that's kind of all I had to add. I will put the uh, flyer in the chat that has my contact info. You can reach out um, with any questions, but that's all I have. Thank you, Blaine. So this um, platform, this website that they have is, is a really cool opportunity for sharing. So thank you for the hard work going into it. And I know that Angela Ehlers is with the South Dakota Association of Conservation Districts, and you have put a lot of work into it along with your, the rest of your team. So thank you. Um, I would ask, um, Angela, would you have anything you'd like to add from the Conservation District's perspective? No, Blaine did a good job, but we encourage everyone to get involved. Thank you very much. So super. OK, um, any questions for Blaine and, and the crew? 
All right, great. Then we'll move on. Um, we'll have Laura Kaler with the Soft Club Grasslands Coalition next. And then after Laura will be Jewel Borg and then Cindy Zink. All right, can everyone see my screen? Yes. Okay, sounds good. My name is Laura Kaler, Director of the South Dakota Grasslands Initiative. I got to see a lot of you last week, or maybe it was two weeks now, at the South Dakota Grassland Summit. I just want to give a quick recap of that and where we're looking at going from there. Um, you'll notice in this picture on the first screen, a big talk of the event was the backdrop that we use. Um, it was also utilized at the South Dakota uh, or at Pheasant Fest, which was held in Sioux Falls. And then we got to uh, utilize it again at the Grassland Summit. So that was a really great piece to have there. Then just would like to give a little bit of recognition to our steering committee of the initiative and the planning committee of the summit. Um, these individuals were really valuable in helping pull it all together. Um, a lot of meetings went into it, a lot of time planning it, doing some background work, and then at the event as well, thank you to these individuals. A um, few little, sorry, this is, couldn't get it in presenter mode. I also am more of a Zoom person than uh, Teams, but so if you look at all the information starting at the top left, we had 282 people registered for the summit and we had 242 people checked in. You can see there we have a listing of the diverse types of attendees that we had. And so we were hoping to get that diverse attendance and we did. Although, of course, afterwards, we're also brainstorming who else we could have invited and for future events that we can include them as well. We had 29 different sponsors of which 25 were there present. A uh, piece that the vendors really seemed to like and the attendees as well as that the sponsors were uh, the sponsors who were there as vendors also were set up in that same room. And so they really got to be a part of the conversation, listening to it. And then when we had breakout sessions um, and table groups, they joined in the conversations there. Middle column on the screen, you can see our speakers that we had. And then on the far right, um, some of the components we had was a social Monday evening. We had a poster show. Uh, the poster show included some more research type of presentations as well as um, some more just project based seeing what producers are doing on the ground. So that was a really nice piece for people to go and look at during breaks. Uh, we had a coffee time with the speakers. I was able to go through and introduce a little bit more about the initiative and our goals, which I'll highlight briefly now as well. Um, we had a time where Attendees got to break out with their peer groups and really focus on some conversations of where do we go from here? How can we utilize the resources that we have and our specific role to support the grasslands? And then we also ended with a policy forum. So overall, um, I heard a lot of great comments on it. If you attended and you haven't yet, please fill out the feedback form just so we can kind of gather some ideas of what pieces to keep and what to tweak if we do this again in the future. So during the day two, and I know we're getting tight on time, so I'm going to hit these quickly. And if anyone would like to discuss them further, please feel free to give me a call. Um, but in January, I went around the state and met with different partners of the initiative. There was about 100 people total that I met with, um, and I got some feedback about what they would like to see the initiative do. Recognizing that there's a lot of things that could happen for the grasslands, but specifically this collaborative network of partners which is the South Dakota Grasslands Initiative, what could be more successful through collaboration? Um, and from that, I pulled out five key goals that we're looking at moving forward with. The first one is focusing on connecting producers and programs that exist for grassland conservation. And we are looking at developing a committee to focus on this area. The next goal is partner engagement. So keeping that partner to partner communication, collaboration and coordination going. And so that's pieces like our quarterly, monthly meetings, uh, newsletters, and other aspects that we've been doing. Goal three, uh, this came up a lot at our partner meetings, a lot of interest in what can we do to better market the grasslands to make people as aware of grassland loss as they are of rainforest loss. Um, and hand in hand with marketing is also education of both kids through adults, producers, urban, um, and so we're looking at starting off with a marketing committee and then also having an education committee. Those two will probably work in communication, but a little bit different focus of their uh, work. 
goal four of the initiative is using research to support the grasslands. Um, so just helping distribute the research that's being done and sharing the information with those who need it. And our fifth goal, uh, this one I think has a lot of interest right now to move forward with, and so we will be developing a committee for it, is educating decision makers and supporting programs that sustain the grasslands. Um, so both educating those decision makers and then trying to find some policies that they would like, that all the partners would like to move forward with supporting together. Um, so we can have a little bit stronger push on that. Um, if you haven't already, if you were at the summit and heard about this, or if you heard about it today and you've got some thoughts on the goals and committees that I've listed, um, you can scan this QR code right now and give me some feedback on the committees and goals. Pretty soon, probably in a couple of weeks, there'll be a form going out that if you would like to serve on one of these committees, you can apply to do that. Um, but if you're not ready to commit to serving on a committee, there's still going to be plenty of ways that you can support the initiative and these projects, um, even if you're not a committee member. And so then our third way of being involved with the initiative is to continue to support what others are doing, um, sharing what's happening, and making everything more impactful. So that is my synopsis. Any questions on the summit or what we're looking at doing next? All right, um, I'll throw my email in the chat in case anybody does want to reach out to me. Otherwise, I'll hand the floor over to Jewel. Thank you, Laura. And next we have on the question on the uh, state tank committee is Jewel Borg, please. Oh, you're muted. Try again, Jewel. You're muted right now. There, can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you. Gotcha. Thank okay. you. Okay, all right. All right, thank, thank you, everybody. Um, I'm Jewel Bork. I work for South Central RCND. Uh, currently, we have a conservation collaborative agreement with NRCS to do education and outreach um, for with Woody encroachment. Um, in the counties of Jones, Millette, Todd, and Tripp. Um, so we have began, we did some education uh, meetings in February uh, with in um, Mission and in Winter. Um, and from those meetings, we had about 28 at our Mission or Winter meeting and 29 in our um, mission meeting and from that we did some survey and um, we have a lot of producers that wanted to learn more on brush management also um, along with eastern red cedar control so um, currently I'm putting together another uh, workshop to be held in mission and we're going to be doing more focus on um, snowberry um, control and um, with yucca and sumac. That seems to be some of the issues um, of the plants that producers are having in their rangeland. So we're gonna be focusing on that. Um, we've met with the tribe and visited with them on some uh, encroachment control. Um, and then we are going to be doing some outreach at some uh, community events this summer. We've got some set up in winter and in White River at some rodeo events that they have coming up and again in August. And then at the um, summit that I attended in Oklahoma, we I met uh, with uh, Dirac Twidwell and he had done um, a workshop on woody encroach or an eastern red cedar 
encroachment a couple years ago in White River um, and uh, wanted to do a follow-up workshop. So currently we're going to be working with him and seeing if we can do some a follow-up um, with him maybe in the next maybe next year and uh, do some more fall smaller breakout sessions with him too because he uh, would like to do some more work down in the area um, down in our area with that so um, and then um, the Todd County School District has gotten a hold of South Central and they would like for us to come and do some education with their school system and so we're going to be visiting with them and um, doing some outreach there so um, that's what we kind of have on our calendar here for the next few months coming up. Oh, you're a busy lady thanks for the update so you're, all good you. stuff. Okay, moving on, we've got Cindy Zank with the South Dakota Soil Health Coalition, please. Good morning. Thank you, Tony and Colette, for the invitation. And I just wanted to give a quick update. I know they did put in the handouts a new resource that everyone can request from the NRCS state office. We worked in partnership with them. It is called the Cover Crop Poster. Um, Marsha Dunicki and the Tech Committee um, continues to update the table one, which is a useful tool if you are utilizing um, cover crops in your rotation. And we just thought having that updated uh, table one was so important for people that we wanted to make sure we could get that in the hands of not only the farmers and ranchers, but also the partners to be able to use as how to make a, a good cover crop mix. So the cover crop poster, the main focus obviously is the table one that um, NRCS keeps updated. Um, it has the just the pertinent information that you need when you're making a cover crop mix. Um, this QR code goes directly to the NRCS website on cover crops, so it has that additional information. Anyone that wants one can contact the NRCS state office and Randy Papka has a supply there. Um, the local offices will be getting them. I don't know that she's had an opportunity to get them out yet. So please, um, if you're wanting to, you can check with the local offices in, in a short time here. Um, another aspect that's new on our poster is just a little um, infographic that we thought everyone wanted to see some of the benefits, but also what we don't necessarily see in the cover crops is what's below the ground and what really is um, impactful on our ground and our soil. So we appreciate all the technical people from SDSU and NRCS assisting um, in updating the poster. So if anyone has any questions, um, the coalition appreciates all the partners assistance with this new poster, but it I do think it'll be a very useful tool having out in your shops and for you to hand out to producers as you work with them. Awesome. Thank you, Cindy. I know that the Soil Health Coalition has a lot, a lot of things happening, so I'd encourage everyone to visit their calendar of events page on their website and to follow up with the articles on there because they're they've got a lot of things going on that are really great. So thank you very much, Cindy. Absolutely. Any comments for the partners? Any comments for the partners so far? If not, then I'm going to ask um, Matt uh, Gottlob to please uh, step forward for the Pheasants Forever update. Thanks for the time, Colette and Tony. Great to see everybody. Um, I do not have a handout to share with everyone, but just uh, we'll give a verbal update. So I want to give a big shout out to everyone, uh, including many of you in the room and on the call today, and uh, your help in making Pheasant Fest a uh, success. So March 1st, 2nd, and 3rd in Sioux Falls. Uh, it was a great, great event, highly successful. Um, general public in attendance was over 35,000 people. Um, so that was great on that side of things, but maybe even more so on the backside as far as partnerships and meetings. So had an NRCS uh, partnership meeting there. Um, Tony and myself spoke on the success of the partnership here in South Dakota and shared uh, a lot of the great work that my field staff do on a daily basis in working in partnership with NRCS and other partners across the state. So uh, had a couple other meetings throughout the weekend as well. 
um, had a partners working session aimed at recruitment and retention of field staff um, in the field in general. So had uh, SDSU staff there as well as NRCS, Game Fish and Parks, and lots of other conservation partners uh, from the state. So thanks again to those of you on the call and off uh, for attending as well. Also had an access workshop that Friday morning of Pheasant Fest as well, uh, talking about using some of the VPA HIP funding through uh, the federal farm bill as well as <coughs> state programs across the country. Excuse me. And uh, yeah, another very high highly successful program. And we shared, <coughs> excuse me, sorry, I'm fighting a cold here pretty much since Pheasant Fest. But uh, yeah, shared on the success of our um, our program here in South Dakota, our public access to habitat program, which pairs on the Game Fish and Parks walk-in area access program. So um, again, had a lot of important people there throughout the weekend. USDA uh, Undersecretary Robert Bonney was there, um, was on the show floor on Saturday and made an announcement there as far as the Northern Bob White pilot project. So uh, some kind of exciting things nationwide going on there. Um, had some other um, good social events throughout the weekend as well, including a Partners in Conservation event and uh, uh, an Upland Rally on Friday night and a National Banquet on Saturday night with uh, decorated um, biologists and outdoorsmen Donnie Vinson. So also want to thank some of the staff on the call here as well that uh, spoke at a couple different things going on specifically for landowners throughout the weekend. One of them was a prescribed fire panel, which we had a daily um, presentation on that on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. So big shout out to Pete Bauman, Sean Kelly, and Cody Grewing, um, as well as uh, some other staff uh, of mine that helped fill in as well. Um, that uh, had, a, had a lot of people in attendance at all the presentations all weekend long. Uh, also want to thank the Conservation District for their help in um, planning and funding for the <coughs> you, um, those beautiful displays that Laura had pictures from the Grassland Coalition. So um, I definitely should have taken more pictures throughout the weekend to be able to document that, but uh, I, I might be able to track some of those down from my team. So absolutely incredible uh, display there in the main entryway leading into Pheasant Fest there. So absolutely um again incredible can't say enough to thank colette and angela for their parts in making that happen uh really really crucial showing the importance of the uh, importance of grasslands here in south dakota and across the country and those displays really keying in on the woody encroachment and those issues here um really really hats off to them again so um, just a couple other things from Pheasant Fest. So uh, we also had our Habitat Help Desk there and uh, want to th thank Game Fish and Parks staff that attended as well. Uh, had Fish and Wildlife Service uh, employees around as well, providing technical assistance to landowners. And we reached over 500 landowners from 15 states across the country and uh, provided technical assistance um, and over 23,000 acres throughout the weekend. So really highly successful event. Uh, other things going on here in South Dakota with Pheasants Forever. Um, we applied for some grant funding uh, to help with the prescribed fire effort we wanna get off the ground in targeting woody encroachment. So uh, hopefully we'll find out in May on our status of those applications. Hopefully we'll uh, have uh, up to eight staff getting on the ground here in the very near future. Um, again, aimed at tackling that woody encroachment through um, providing technical assistance, uh, writing prescribed burn plans, as well as uh, tying into some of those prescribed burn associations across the state. Um, also, we'll have uh, two positions with our Every Acre Counts program. Um, as uh, working through SDSU uh, extension through that RCPP that Matt, Matt Morlock, excuse me, shared on earlier. So um, that's kind of what we have going on here. And uh, again, thanks to Colette and Tony for the time and uh, appreciate hearing all the other partner updates and would take any questions if anybody has them. Perfect. Very, very good. Lots going on with your organization as well. 
So um, are there any other partners on the still on the call that would like to provide an update? Or anyone that would have questions? Okay, well, this is this is a really lightning section of the, of the agenda for me too, is hearing what our partners have going on. There's so much happening around the state and it's just, it's really great to have a forum where you can share your ideas. There, um, there are a couple of things before I let everyone go and close the meeting. Uh, the South Dakota Grassland Coalition uh, did have a new joint project just as the cover crop poster with the Soil Health Coalition is now available. The South Dakota Grassland Coalition is working with us for a children's uh, coloring book on grasslands and it's called um, uh, Randy, you'll put it up on the screen. It's, yeah. it's like a, it's really fun coloring book and that's available now. Um, it's on the website as a PDF. We're waiting for hard copies to um, to arrive uh, from our distribution center. But it's, it's again, it's a really fun little exploration of uh, aliens as they come down into the grasslands and they explore different facets of the of the grasslands and, and from the microbial life up to the larger life. So really fun. Um, also, there are um, there's a conservation planning get started with a USDA programs guide that's it's been out for a little while, but I'm not sure that people are aware of it. And there is a flyer about it in the handout. And the last little thing is currently there are some National Wildlife Federation um, MIPI grants for education and outreach available. And the flyer is in the uh, the handout too. So uh, lots of opportunities. We just need um, maybe more integration of uh, how to get all these exciting opportunities integrated to our outreach efforts. So thanks again for everybody. Tony, would you have any um, final comments for the day? Just that I really do appreciate everybody's time today. Uh, again, I know that everybody has extremely busy schedules and this has been well, almost a three hour meeting. So I appreciate everybody's time and just being a part of this because it really, there's not a single organization that we have across South Dakota that can do it all. This really is a partnership between all of our organizations to actually be successful in trying to meet all of our different resource concerns that we have across the state. So just thank you for your efforts. Thank you for what you do for our producers across the state. And um, I guess we're, we're working on scheduling our next meetings already. So it looks like we have a in-person meeting in Pierre. It's going to be May 22nd. Do we have a location for that one yet? No. Okay, so we'll be working on getting a, a location for our May 22nd meeting. We'll also have an in-person meeting here in Huron on August 27th. So those are our next two dates for our state technical uh, committees. So with that, I just want to say thank you again. And any other closing items? Yep, that's all okay. of it. Thank you all. And we'll have this recording posted also if anybody else wants to see this. But uh, thank you again and have a great rest of your week. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye-bye.